a constructive program as it is spoken in english refers to a translation of what was in the indian ethos called rachanatmak karyakram the word rachana meant creation so there is a sense of creativity and in that sense it is reconstruction gandhi gave this concept first to the nation and through nation to the world whenever a change in society is engineered it has two components the change comes through struggle or revolution when you dismantle the old structures old values and that is the protest resistance and struggle to dismantle the old systems because the old system has become degenerated a lot of vested interest and anti human and in that sense you are working for a new society it's a regeneration of a new society now obviously the process of struggle is extremely important and the energy that you have to put in at the time of dismantling the old structure is tremendous but gandhi is really one of the few visionaries who thought that it is not enough to do only the dismantling process there is a simultaneity in recreating the new society so as on you are dismantling the old structures the cadre also is necessarily reconstructing creating the new society and the work that is done under this process and the program that is undertaken in this process is known as the constructive program till about 1915 when gandhi came to india and joined the freedom struggle it was only a political protest struggle to gain political independence but gandhi envisioned that when the political independence will come the need for working to regenerate a society also is going to be very very acute that is how gandhi planned and instructed and extended this idea to his workers that there has to be a reconstruction program taken what was it in the indian context reconstruction this is very important and simple he could see that this should have involved awareness creation among people so that people actually graduated themselves into good citizens with a production program that would lead to an equitous society so it had a component of production program and activities related to production program which would obviously take into account the basic vision which was there and gandhi's basic vision was reconstructing a new equitous and humane rural society in today's context we might find this little outdated but in those days about 100 years back gandhi was very clear that he was recreating essentially a rural society where the production program was going to be of the decentralized production systems and in order to generate that system you needed accordingly an educational program so the educational program at an individual which is at the child level and also at an adult level combined together made this constructive program so this entire constructive program when he designed were 18 number and one can access them but the basic point that gandhi was trying to make was that along with the protest and the struggle that any society undertakes according to the vision of the society you need to have a constructive program for rebuilding the nation
what is a violent society going through these days? A violent society essentially is trying to control resources and human beings. And this control has to be so total that only a few sections of population would acquire all the wealth that is around and the wealth that is going to be created. In this both the legal and extra-legal institutions and practices come to stay and operate. In all such societies which have become violent and when the state also is a willing or an unwilling party to this and establishes kinds of unholy nexus with legal and illegal business, the violence increases, intensifies. Now in such a society, if there has to be a turn around and if we are talking about visioning a new society, obviously one is talking about how to gain peace and justice in the society. Justice itself means equity in some sense, at least in an economic sense. And the re-establishment of equity in a society which would also bring peace would depend upon the kind of vision that one has. So contextualizing this with what was the vision or what is the vision in the Gandhian uh, thought about a society which is peaceful and which is just is what he would have called as Ahimsa Samaj or a non-violent society. Here non-violent, the word non-violence is not used in terms of an adjective but it is more the noun. The society itself is known as, it is named as a non-violent society. Where non-violence is not used as a strategy to establish peace but non-violence becomes a way of life. That is how you actually turn into turn a society into a peaceful society with justice. So at present the violent society or the societies which think that they have become violent as the case may be or even for that matter if the Mexico as a state thinks a society which realizes that it is so, then it has to also first change its vision and see that its vision now is to rebuild a non-violent society. In building non-violent society, it is it, the nearest that the mainstream world is going to is to the world of sustainable society, sustainable development. But unfortunately, this sustainability, as it is understood, tries to balance between the overuse or the ill use of the natural resources or the human nature interaction. But Gandhian thought goes little beyond, and it is seeking harmony between human beings and the nature whose resources human society is using to flourish and not to survive. So that this is the difference. So even a society which is trying to develop will have to make this distinction and understand and accept and internalize that it is going to have a society which is not going to be an acquisitive society, acquisitive individuals. Because all this generates into direct, manifest or hidden or structural violence. And the manifest violence is the result of deep structural violence operating for many years. So the first set of constructive programs would be to envision and build a society on non-violent basis. So accordingly all the programs will have to be adjusted by the society and I think the beginning has to be that you will have to remodule your economic program and economic structure basically which would help then in building the non-violent society. So one will have to decide between rural, urban, constraints, industry, agriculture, nature and artificial, all these things will have to be settled first. Out of that constructive program will emerge which will help in building peace and just How does an individual become 
ए सत्याग्रही और ए पार्टिसिपेंट इन ए प्रोटेस्ट मूवमेंट इन ए सोसाइटी देर इज ए डिसकंटेंट एंड दैट डिसकंटेंट इज एक्सप्रेस एट एन इंडिविजुअल लेवल इट इज नॉट जस्ट एनफ टू एक्सप्रेस इट आउटवर्डली देर इज ए sense of responsibility a sense of duty attached to it and there is a there is an understanding and, and a mindset to this concept of offering protest or being a dissenter in a society and a forceful and meaningful and ethical dissenter uh, has to essentially be a person who is willing to sacrifice self unless this quality is internalized and practiced a person does not become effective dissenter or a protest person why is this important i think again this concept has been understood and given to all by gandhi the purity of soul and the purpose of doing it is not to destroy for the sake of destruction but to build again the vision is building of a non violent society and in that non violent society you can't be acquisitive you can't be doing things for yourself so self interest really does not dominate you have to be prepared to give up for the society for the opponent for the persons you love i think this is this is the strong point that he was trying to make that the force that exists within us is the force what he had called love force truth force and soul force he used all the three words interchangeably to communicate that there is a willingness on the part of the self to give up everything for the cause that makes a protester honest integrated and ethical protester so there is when you do this kind of exercise then your indulgence in the in the materiality of things at an individual or at societal level the indulgence is with a sense of renunciation now this is what he had understood from the indian culture in the indian ethos and indian classics upanishads this is very much emphasized where indulgence in material things is with a sense of renunciation it is that this is not mine this has been given by the giver the god and everything that changes everything that is made everything is by god and in that sense of what is god's i am indulging in i need to have a sense of renunciation because this is not mine this is slightly uh, spiritual and perhaps mystical but it is not so when we are talking about even about changing the society or building a non violent and just society this is very much essential as uh, a a pre qualification or a qualification that is essential uh, for a person who is trying to seek change and change for a society that is a non violent society so both these aspects will have to be understood that a person who is going up to protest and you know get involved in the constructive program for building a new society has to do with this sense of carrying sacrifice self sacrifice to a level and actually indulging in things with a sense of renunciation how does one train one self now this is very essential an individual who is out to protest and form a non violent society 
must be a well trained individual well educated individual gandhi had gandhi was confronted with this problem especially with the inmates of the ashram who wanted to know and ashram was the place where people lived as a community and were supposed or expected to behave in a particular fashion in individually and collectively and they always had problems and they always had questions so when they asked gandhi gandhi at that time was sitting in a jail in yarwada in pune and he started writing letters and those letters were read on every tuesday morning and the collection of those letters came to be known as letters from yarwada and then here is a small piece from yarwada mandir mandir is a temple anyhow i think it's interesting to look at uh, in in these letters look into these letters where he gave what he eventually called them as 11 vows which he thought were very very essential for any individual to train self in this whole struggle to build a non violent society whether it was a protest struggle or reconstruction or taking up constructive program an individual and the focus is an individual and the individual has to educate cultivate and train self and an individual was supposed to follow a set of vows unless you go up to the level of taking a vow you are not trained your intensity of feeling at the self level doesn't come unless you get into this and what were these we will simply first read them out there is no time to get into the depth but this small little booklet is interesting the first of course is truth and each individual has to look for the truth truth is what you have to ultimately proceed towards and look for with the vision which has both spirituality in it and this worldly affairs in it it's a combination of both but you are looking for the truth in it truth is the ultimate thing that you are looking for and searching for which he did himself now the search for truth is through behaving non violently and in this non violent behavior the force is the love force that's what he was saying because unless you have this love force in your soul which also becomes a soul force you cannot be pursuing uh, your pursuit is not going to be uh, successful without non violent approach interestingly the third he was he has put his important vow as brahmacharya or chastity now this might appear a little funny to some but gandhi was trying to say that it is non indulgence into the carnal and worldly pleasures and i think this this is this has to be understood and internalized because such indulgence leads to very often leads to violence and and digression from the truth so he insisted that this must be the mindset and those who can practice chastity and celibacy is an important precondition for this but what he meant by this was an overall uh, sense of chastity and non indulgence into worldly and carnal pleasures i think that is very important non acquisitive nature that you don't make all the worldly possession yours the point about renunciation that we have to understand is the one then the next is non stealing and non stealing is in this sense which says that even taking what is not due to you is non stealing and then of course he also talked about fearlessness bread labor all these were essential qualities there are four more vows but they had a contextual understanding for the indian society tolerance was one of them untouchability was the other swadeshi was the third but each society has to look for its own vows 
according to the understanding and need of the society. But these vows put together will make an individual who will travel on the path of building a non-violent society. Process of rebuilding societies has an important aspect of creating awareness in the people in order to have mass participation. Because when we are changing the society, the participation of masses is extremely important. This is the illustration which Gandhi had tried to give to the whole world that it was the change was not brought in by few, but the change was brought in by many. And for doing this, mostly it is realized that in, in many societies, rather in most societies, awareness level of people about their rights, about their duties, about the way society functions, uh, the rules that govern them, uh, the rights that they must, they have and the duties that they need to perform are all in the area of ignorance and darkness. So, one of the most effective programs that any protest movement or uh, a revolutionary group that has uh, started a protest movement in a society has to do is create this awareness about rights and duties. Uh, this is an important activity which a movement should consider. Uh, for this, of course, this is a kind of an extension activity which should become a planned or a programmed activity for the group which is uh, ushering in the new era or the building of the new society. In the long run or in the new society that you want to build, uh, creating awareness is part of an extension education. But what is the basic education that you do with the children so that a new generation also is prepared this is the responsibility of the society to uh, educate the new generation both for becoming aware of what they should be doing and how they should be behaving like good citizens and changing societies and also be part of the change that is coming up. Now Gandhi also had envisioned that and he had introduced what he called basic education or uh, new education. It was new in the sense because whatever was conventionally going on he was trying to change that and basic in this sense that it was very fundamental to the building of the new society. And in this basic education, uh, both the content and the method uh, were different from what obtained in those days in this country. Unfortunately, even in India, the kind of basic education which Gandhi talked about is not implemented in full or even to that extent uh, since, uh, at a sincere critical minimum level, but nevertheless it has its potential and any society which is trying to bring in such kind of a change towards building a non-violent and just society, one sure way of doing it is uh, getting into this whole concept of basic education. And in this basic education the idea is to educate the child in all the faculties, it is not only a mental faculty that has to grow. There is a development of the body that also must take place. There is an educating of hands, educating of the body to get into skilled work. So one component of that education is development of skill, use of hands. And the second component and also which is the most important component is to build the character in person. Gandhi emphasized this character aspect so much because individual strong characters, ethical characters are going to create good social values. The third aspect of course remains that we all know is the development of the intellect. So in that sense putting it very succinctly what Gandhi was trying to tell in basic education was educating heart and, and head. This is the 3H that he was talking about. Now combining this with an extension activity, the education component of protest movement and building of the new society becomes the strongest.
two more constituencies are very important in effecting the change in society. This has been true in case of India and this is also true in case of Mexico. One is the constituency of native people. India also has been a colony and Mexico also has been a colony. So there is a strong presence of, why strong? There is an initial presence of the native people who have been there. And it is necessary that for integrating them with the main society, rather it should have been the other way around. The outsider should have got integrated. And to a large extent it is true, both in India and Mexico, the outsiders have integrated, but outsiders also have been dominant. Because of this situation, the natives have taken back seat. Now it is extremely important that natives are also accepted as the main people, the mainland people, and they are also able to represent themselves, their interests, their economic interests, their cultural interests, their social interests, forcefully into this new society that is being thought about. Otherwise, we will also be creating the similar kind of a society and then there will be scope for another revolution in that society. Also, if you try to ignore this important constituency. And it is very likely that some of the things that we have talked about in terms of building a non-violent society, the seeds or the characteristics of this non-violent society already obtained in those native society because they have survived, they have been there for centuries in harmony with nature, in harmony with each other. So we need to also learn from them and there may be quite uh, useful and quick for us to learn how to build a kind of a harmonious society or a non-violent and just society. Any sectional society which is in the modern sense seeking change, a revolution, must take into account and provide space for this native section of the population for representation. Second, of course, is very well known and it is known in the developed society as well as developing society is about the gender equity and the status of women. I think in all the kind of traditional societies uh, and in most traditions, the role of women have been kind of secondary and therefore they have, there has been an exploitative relationship between the gender, uh, male and the female genders. So the gender equity also essentially would mean that how do you really uh, treat uh, women's constituency as we have been looking at, at the native's constituency, rather we should say the marginalized sections, the constituency of the marginalized. In that sense, women across the economic status are in some sense marginalized and also this creates a little more complication in dealing with this but nevertheless we cannot say that this problem does not exist and therefore we have to be very conscious. The only caution that we need to exercise in this is that when we are talking about gender equity we are not talking about an you know sameness or both being on, on the same level it is not in that sense that we are talking about. The equity here means that there is an equality of opportunity that men and women for the gender are not discriminated against because a, a particular person is belonging to a particular gender. That is the point. But when we are talking about this, the principle of self-development through Levin vows applies to both men and women. So in that sense, in a Gandhian sense, a volunteer or a protester or a volunteer for the new society should go through similar kind of educative process, should actually be practicing the same eleven vows as has been described. So it is not only for men, it is also for men and women both. And in this sense, gender sensitivity with this kind of practice of eleven vows brings in a new human being. Now that when you realize, you will automatically create a space for the discriminated section, be it women or a marginalized section. In this sense, I think both these important constituencies in Mexico must also be uh, presented and represented in the entire movement and building of the new society.
there is an effective instrument of offering protest and resistance for change. And Gandhi gave the term Satyagraha, insistence for truth, protesting for truth. Now, it was understood that the truth also which is relative, because the quest for truth continues lifelong, but for a particular point in time, for a particular issue, if the truth is known depending upon the facts which are physical, circumstantial and spiritual to an extent, then one can offer the protest. And a non-violent way of protesting is offering civil disobedience. Now, obviously, disobedience is not uh, being obedient. So, it can be vis-a-vis -vis state, it can be vis-a-vis -vis authority, it can be vis-a-vis -vis an individual. But by and large, in the change movements, in the protest movements we are talking about, it is vis-a-vis the state. And therefore, state has a law and you do not obey it, so it becomes disobedience. But if you are barred and banned in doing into something, and if you resist that, that becomes civil resistance. The civil, the civility of it is that you are not violent. And this has to be understood and I think in the, in most of the cases today, whether it is India or any other country, this entire method also is assuming more of an instrumentality rather than a soul force which Gandhi would have liked and Gandhi tried to uh, implement it in that way and succeeded to a large extent at least in uh, good number of civil disobedience or civil protests and resistance that uh, he uh, led. But otherwise, normally what is now happening is that there is a sense of instrumentality in it, that you are using this as an instrument to create pressure. And Gandhi's idea was not about creating pressure. Gandhi's idea was to use this as a sole force. And again, he used it interchangeably with love force to help see the opponent, the truth, the way a as a protester, I am able to see. Now, this increases your force and responsibility both. And in, it is in this context that I am resisting a state law, I am being disobedient. So, because the position of the state or the position of the authority, I see as untruthful. And I have a vision of a truth. And I am very sure about that truth. And people who are with me, they are also able to see this truth. And in order to establish this truth, I am protesting against the untruth. That may be a law, that may be an authority, which is being enforced. So, I am disobeying it. Now, this is civil disobedience. And it is in this context of civil disobedience that Indian freedom struggle had taken place. In the post-independent scenario, as I had said, as I have just said, that it is reduced to, in some sense, an instrumentality against which we will have to guard ourselves. In order to lead or participate in a satyagraha or a civil disobedient or a civil resistance movement, it is very important to understand what is being resisted or protested. A thorough knowledge of that is essential before doing the act. Now, unless the leader and the followers are clear about the nuances of what is being opposed, 
it is very likely that we are not opposing the law but we are opposing the people or the persons who are involved in it this important distinction is necessary because again going back to the gandhian concept in civil disobedience it is something that is being enforced on you which is being protested but the enforcer is not an enemy therefore in an abstract sense state or the authority is the enemy and the person representing as an individual is not an enemy so this aspect has to be understood and therefore it is more important that we don't symbolize a person who is the implementer or the tormentor and start opposing the tormentor instead of opposing the law that he or she is trying to enforce and this requires a lot of training before putting together a civil disobedient movement now this has to be not only planned but a systematic education of what is being opposed has to take place with the community with the group which is going to join the protest very often in the political movements and especially in the non violent protest movements there is some kind of a jingoism which comes into the place and the people who are opposing don't even know what is being opposed each and every individual in this satyagraha or civil disobedience movement it is expected that each and individual member knows about what is being opposed why is being opposed and how this protest is taking place and what is the role of an individual as a protester so again unless this training and internalization of the values which are inherent in conducting a satyagraha are passed on there is a likelihood that the entire protest movements may fail this is very important to understand because in all such non violent protest movements the role of the tormentor or role of the authority or the state is to crush it and when the protest movement is being crushed or when it is being suppressed or being controlled there is a use of violence because state is not necessarily taken to non violence the state or the authority is not thinking only in terms of returning non violence to the non violence protest it comes down heavily with violence now if there is no training and understanding that you are actually opposing a particular set of laws and not individuals there is always a danger that protester turn violent because they see the immediate suppressor and the tormentor as the person whom they are opposing and your strength of non violence in your protest movement can break down so it is extremely important to train each individual into this process of satyagraha and make them realize that it is the law it is a set of rules that is being opposed and it is not the individuals who are involved and you are not against a person your agraha your your insistence for truth satya is towards a particular phenomena a rule law and understanding and not set of individuals the time has arrived when we should rethink our strategies and ways and means to go ahead in the brave new world the problems that we are faced with today is violence and greed 
resulting into destruction of human beings and environment both. It is not surprising that Mahatma Gandhi is being remembered once again and it is also not surprising that in 2007 United Nations decided to declare 2nd October the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi as the day of non-violence and peace. Peace is what the world is looking for and I think the way of achieving it is going to be adopting the constructive program of Mahatma Gandhi. It is an important aspect of Gandhian thought. Gandhi gave the idea of protest, civil protest, protest with love, protest for truth. But he also had a second component, a vital component, a complementary component to it in terms of constructive program because he had envisioned a particular kind of a society which was which was a non-violent society, a just society, a humane society, largely a rural society. We may not be able to go back to the kind of rural society which Mahatma Gandhi had thought about hundred years back. Nevertheless, we can still think about a society where human species, qua species, is trying to claim less from the nature trying to harmonize with nature. In that kind of a vision, a new economics has to be practiced. And is in this new economics, there has to be a considered and conserved and limited use of natural resources for the material welfare. Unless we share this vision globally, neither India nor Mexico can think of building a Gandhian uh, society for that matter or society based on Gandhian vision and thought. Now, in this context, we also have to bring in the education we should really reorient our education systems, train the 